I think when you turn on the TV, you read any news article, inflation is the first thing on investors' minds. But, you know, without belaboring the obvious, I mean, it's, it's no surprise in, inflation is, is evident and it's present. <music> Hi, it's Greg Gornert, Investment Advisor with Canico Genuity Wealth Management and Gornert Wealth Management. Now, welcome to the channel where we help you make sense of the financial world. Now, today, I'm going to be joined by Meng Gao, Senior Associate, Advisory Solutions at Canico Genuity. Meng, how are you? I'm good, Greg. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Always, always a pleasure having you on. Now, hey, a little segment that we're starting to do right now is we're going to be talking about, you know, big investment themes in the marketplace right now. And, and you always have your ear to the ground working with Kevin Vandermeer. And I really want to get your sense of what you're hearing, you know, from Bay Street uh, and the markets in general. Uh, I think the big topic on everyone's mind right now is inflation. What are your thoughts there and, and, and what are you hearing? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Greg. I mean, um, I think when you turn on the TV, you read any news article, inflation is the first thing on investors' minds. But, you know, without belaboring the obvious, I mean, it's, it's no surprise in, inflation is, is evident and it's present. But... I personally don't think it's, you know, as accelerated or as fast as people actually think. I mean, inflation is, I think, the highest since it's been for the past 31 years. But if you look at the underlying issue and what's causing it, it's the supply chain issue, right? When you have, you know, ships and, and deliveries on delays and people paying more and more for port access, you know, pay, people paying more for deliveries, it's prices are bound to increase. But I think that's driven by, you know, emerging markets lack of vaccines and you know although the pandemic and COVID-19 looks like it's over for the, the developed countries it's still a bit struggling um, you know with vaccine supplies in the emerging countries where a lot of these supplies are actually being shipped so I think as you see and as we see um, vaccines get rolled out across the globe um, I think you will see some of the pressure across supply chains get alleviated um, now, I read this interesting thing where, you know, we saw this data that showed savings amongst consumers are actually um, at two trillion or one of the highs it's been since pre pandemic. Now, I think that's a double edged sword, because as you have all the saving and these consumers putting this money into the economy, um, you know, prices and inflation is likely expected to increase on that front. So I think it's interesting. I mean, I wish I knew how this will play out, but I think it's not as dark and gloomy as many think. And ultimately, like, we're, we're, how does this affect the market, right? That's, that's the question that everybody's wondering. Um, but if you look at the Fed's funds rate, right, it's at its all time lows. Um, and if you look at the, 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 you know, the flexibility that b banks are able to lend, it's more flexible than ever. So money is flowing, there's ample liquidity. Um, people are looking for places to put all that liquidity that they've received through the pandemic into the economy. So there's obviously a backup and a delay and a drag on that. And I think, you know, given it's been some time since that liquidity has been injected, we're about to see all of that into action. So I think in time, we'll see some of those pressure get relieved and, you know, we'll we'll see if inflation is really transitory or not. Yeah, I mean, and that's a good point because I, I you know, I, I can't think of a point in history where the consumer has come out of a recession in such a strong financial condition. I mean, you know, we've been talking, I've been joking about this on this show for the past, you know, six, seven months that, you know, when's the last time that consumers have, a, you know, $80,000 burning a hole in their pocket they want to spend by next Tuesday. Uh, and there just hasn't been a way to spend it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's going to be fueling inflation as well. But that, uh, you know, you know, you know, North Americans are a consumer society, and, and that fuels a lot of uh, fuels a lot of growth out there. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I think the other thing that when we look at inflation, yes, we don't like to see it, but you know, it is positive for certain sectors. I mean, the banking sector, um, you know, makes money on the on the, the on the curve. Um, other areas that we're taking a look at right now that seem to be um, active we talked about in the market are um you know cryptocurrencies and bitcoins what, what are you seeing there because i get a lot of calls and people ask about this a lot of people don't understand what they are uh, a lot of people try to make you know you know heads and tails out of uh you know what what it is and you know what the investment thesis is what, what are you hearing from your side 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very open-ended uh, theme, but I'll try to make the best of it. Um, I think, you know, th there's a speculative gene that's in the market. You know, many years ago, that would be pouring into junior mining stocks, for instance, right? And then yeah. a few months ago, a few years ago, you would find anything to do with EV or, or, or batteries, you yeah. know, money pouring in there. Um, cryptocurrencies has been a pretty prevalent theme. Um, sometimes it's the hottest theme, sometimes it's second, sometimes it's third. I think there's a lot, you know, when you hear the Shiba coins, Doge coins, I think there's a lot of coins out there that, you know, for lack of a better word, have no value. But, you know, some of the coins in the projects are pretty interesting and, and for lack of a better word, pretty legitimate. I mean, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is the most popular coin. It's the bellwether. Um, for me, I think Bitcoin's a true, it's one of a usage of storage of value. Um, there's not really much utility for that, um, but you know, just like many things that people buy in life, there's, you know, really no reason to buy certain things. But if you have the money, you have the liquidity, people are willing to pay up to whatever they think the value is worth. Um, now, the second little brother to Bitcoin is obviously Ethereum. Um, e I think Ethereum has a lot of utility. Um, for one, ever since Web 3.0 has been brought mm -hmm. up and the whole decentralization, you know, decentralized finance, Ether is used in a lot of the things called a smart contract. Um, and, and we can, that's a whole another episode. But what I'm trying to get at is Ether has a lot of utility as well as some other, other projects that you hear, such as, you know, um, Solana. There's a new SAN project. But I would just be careful with some of the coins that, you know, have literally infinity amount of supply. Um, you know, a lot of these are really just marketing tactics. And, and I think the consumer behavior is that once you saw, you know, Dogecoin fly up, you know, hundreds and thousands of percent in, in less than a year, the next coin that everybody thinks, whether it has true value or meaning or not, you know, you have one person throwing in 400 bucks, another person throwing in 2000. And it might not be their entire portfolio, but once you have the entire globe pouring a little bit of their amount in and, and nobody's really selling until they get that quote unquote pop, that's how you create that, you know, moon moment where you saw Shiba coin. I mean, I mean, you I'm sure you heard this news where somebody had this crypto wallet that had 8000 bucks and then in less than half a year um, that became a little over five or, or six billion. Now, I, liquidity is obviously an issue. I don't think so and so is able of that. to. Yes, it's going to sell all that. I mean, he he <laughs> or good. she will probably crash the entire market, and the last coin probably sells at a cent. But yeah, it looks pretty. Yeah, I mean, and that that's the other thing too. I mean, because a lot of times uh, you know, we're at that stage in the market where you know where greed is is a powerful um, you know factor. You know, people, there's fear of missing out. There's uh, and, and remember when you're into something like that, in my mind, that you know, it's speculation, it's not investing. We want to draw a hard line on what the difference is in that. I've seen so many people over my career forget to make that distinction, uh, especially with things that you know, perhaps don't uh, think, know as much as they think they know or, or at all. Um, why don't we also draw a hard line between uh, blockchain and crypto? Because that's the other part that people seem to kind of, they lump them together. And um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of utility to, to blockchain, um, and and sometimes that is overlooked in the in it gets lumped into the whole crypto space. Uh, any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think blockchain. You know, look, I'm not a crypto expert by any means, but I'll I'll try to explain it in in a way that a hopefully a two year old would understand. I mean, blockchain in in the simple terms is just a is like a is like a journal. It's like a yeah. ledger that's built in code, um, and the unique thing about that is it's very hard to break. Um, you know, it's imagine a chain with a bunch of blocks and each block has information. Um, but the unique thing about blockchain is that it's coded by computer in a way that there's, there's a technical term called hash key. So once somebody tries to alter the hash key on one block, that hash key is actually tied to the previous block and then so on and so forth. So if you try to alter one block, um, you're going to have to recalculate and, and, and try to fix all the other blocks. Otherwise, there will be a red alarm, a red alert saying, hey, yeah. somebody tried to tamper with this. So you can yeah. see there's a lot of utility for blockchain in many of our industries because of how hard it is to tamper and also, and also how quick um, it is to update and refresh information and yeah. store information on there. So 
to tie these two things together, blockchain is basically, um, crypto is basically an instrument and a coin that is marked and, you know, kept on blockchain technology and blockchain ledgers. Um, there's a lot, obviously a lot of use for, you know, things like crypto blockchain. I think one of the biggest things we're seeing, and I mentioned it earlier, is this whole phenomenon called Web 3.0. So to take a step back, um, you know, we came from Web 1.0. If you if you, you think about Web 1.0, what is Web 1.0? 1.0 is basically, you know, way back when Internet first started, um, you have all this information, almost like in a big encyclopedia. It's just a yep. one page. Um, you just put a plaster bunch of information and, and maybe as the most sophisticated as it gets is linking one uh, link from one web page to another. Yep. And then here comes Web 2.0, which is where the Facebooks, the Google ad tech, and all these things come in. Um, but what's different about that is they're more interactive. And and how did Web 3.0 and all this decentralized idea come from is because, you know, Web 2.0 put the power um, of the content creator into these big corporations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that these crypto guys and these, you know, Web 3.0 guys, they think about it as bringing power back to the content creators. And what that means is, you know, when you visit a website right now in Web 2.0, you know, anything you type, anything, even what you say, if you have, you know, Google Home or Alexa, you know, it gets picked up and this data gets sold, for instance, by Facebook or Google to other um, marketing agencies. And then in turn, they sell that into a product, into, you know, recreating a web page to what you will like and thus almost like taking money from your pocket. So why this this whole decentralization uh, theme come in play in Web 3.0 is giving the power basically back to the content creators. And, you know, it's still a very abstract theme right now, but I think slowly, slowly you will see, you know, infrastructure and companies that wrap their arms around these the, this whole theme and build things. You know, I have no idea what Web 3.0 is really going to look like, but and we're in the very, very first stage of it, first innings, but there's really great development. And I think we were just talking about this the other day at lunch with Kevin, but, you know, sitting in Toronto or in Canada, we're not at the center of this innovation, unfortunately. No. Right. You know, we have, you know, say Waterloo, which people say is the Silicon Valley of Canada, but I would say it's more so focused on, you know, software and on hardware and tech of that nature. But what we, you really want to see is, you know, what's happening in San Francisco, what's happening in Miami. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of these NFTs, non-fungible tokens, yep. right? These, these images Still trying to JPEG. get my head around that to tell you the truth <laughs> as an investment thesis, but that's just me. <laughs> well, Greg, you're a smart guy. And, and to be honest, it's, it's nothing fancy, right? It's, it's literally just a picture that somebody drew up. But the unique thing about it is, you know, the value and why they're sold for, you know, crypto punks. Why are they sold yeah. for a million or $2 million a piece is because they're rare and they're one of a kind. It's almost like, why would you pay, you know, a few million for a real life painting? Well, this mm -hmm. NFT is simply just a rare, rare painting yeah. that somebody decided to tag a $3 million price tag to it, but online. So that's the whole concept. And that's one of the pieces of Web 3.0, which is you, the content creator really gets to own a piece. And yeah. instead of, you know, when you visit a website or on Facebook, you walk away and you kind of have to leave all that great stuff that you gave them to these creators. Web 3.0 is about owning a piece of the internet. Yeah, no, and, and to be clear to everyone that it's a non-fungible token. Uh, I believe I got that right for the NFT. Yeah, um, yeah and, and they have been going for some you know, some serious dough. And I always want, wonders if we're kind of getting near the end of a market cycle when, you know, typically it was, you know, collectibles at the end of, you know, all market cycles tend, tend to move hard. Uh, on that, uh, why don't we talk, you know, last thing just before we go here, talk about maybe the value disconnect between stock market prices and underlying businesses and, and how, you know, what the word is out there. I mean, I think we have some catching up to do on the fundamentals um, to support that. However, you know, I do think we're coming out of a recessionary environment, so um, there probably is some wind at our backs here. But you know, you know, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Greg. I think um, you know we're certainly still living in the era where fundamentals are are truly disconnected from from the company yeah. and, and and reality, right? Like I think we talked about this before the show, but one of the best examples is last week um, a another electric vehicle company IPO called uh, Rivian. And, you know, 
they IPO'd, I think, around 70 bucks and little over three days, it trades up two times into, you know, over 140, 160 bucks. Wow. And if you look at the market cap, it's trading at two times the value, market equity value of Ford. Now, Ford makes hundreds of millions of cars, <laughs> right? And, and what you'd could be go surprised. Wrong? <laughs> exactly. But you'd be surprised, but not surprised. Rivian, you know, so far has sold no cars, zero cars. Yeah. And, you know, revenue line is zero or $100,000. Now, I think we're slowly getting to the part where fundamentals hopefully start connecting. And what I mean by that is, if you think back a year or two ago at the at the start of the pandemic, right, there was this other shell electric vehicle company called Nikola that sold, you know, that that promised to sell these EV, you know, big truck uh, shipping shipping cars. And yes, and that's uh, quite the story in itself. <laughs> exactly, and and I think we're we're slightly you know advanced from that because you know that to be honest, a lot of people say was just putting you know an iPad into into a truck and rolling it down a hill. Whereas I think that is a Rivian... true statement too. They did the video <laughs> with that to make it look like it was running, and that is well documented. They put it on a big hill and let it run down. Yes. Exactly. Whereas I think Rivian, if you take a deep, you know, look, there's actually a lot of um, great designs and, and, and there's actually a good thing in the pipeline. So, yeah. I mean, do I think it's worth what it's worth now? Probably not. But, you know, you know how the market works, Greg, yeah. right, Greg? Like people get sold ideas and dreams. Yeah. And, and if you look at Tesla, um, is it worth what it's at based on its fundamentals? No, but People have been fighting that for the past 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And if you're fighting because against... You've been wrong. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And if you're fighting, fighting against Elon, everybody knows that's not a great idea anymore. And, yeah. you know, before Tesla got into the S&P 500, um, portfolio managers or, or generalists, you can say, can still ignore that stock. But after it's got into the index, um, now, you know, if you don't own that stock, for instance, for the past, uh, you know, three months when... It was likely the, I think it was the only company in the S&P that kind of ran and took on a run. If you didn't own that stock, you'd be probably behind for the last quarter. So I think where, it, you know, it's going is some of these things is, you know, whether it makes sense or not, you might have to put some money at play here and, and just follow um, where the market's trending. Um, and yeah. I think and, and that and that's a good point. I don't, don't don't mean to interrupt, but you brought up one thing too. But in addition to S and P, you know, five hundred. Uh, well, a lot of investors sometimes don't understand that once a lot of portfolio managers have to be closet indexes or are are indexers, so they have no choice but to hold a stock once it's in the index. That's not their choice because they that's their benchmark they use. So they have to have part you know part of it. Then I think sometimes that gets overlooked by you know by by investors. And that's why sometimes you see you know jumps in in uh, in market activity for stocks when they're added to an index or deleted from a particular index as well. Hey, why don't we wrap it up here? Thank you for joining me. You know, just uh, some great content, really interesting thoughts, and uh, you know, please join me again, Mengao. Absolutely, thank you, Greg. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more content like that, please consider subscribing or join me on my website, greggorner.com. That's greggorner.com. Look forward to seeing you there.